The Trial. The Trial, original German title, later, and, is a novel written by Franz Kafka between 1914 and 1915 and published posthumously in 1925. One of his most well known works, it tells the story of Joseph K., a man arrested and prosecuted by a remote, inaccessible authority, with the nature of his crime revealed neither to him nor to the reader. Heavily influenced by Dostoyevsky's Crime and Punishment and the Brothers Karamazov, Kafka even went so far as to call Dostoyevsky a blood relative. Like Kafka's other novels, the trial was never completed, although it does include a chapter which brings the story to an end. After Kafka's death in 1924 his friend and literary executor Max Brod edited the text for publication by Verlag The original manuscript is held at the Museum of Modern Literature, Marbach am Neckar, Germany. The first English-language translation, by Willa and Edwin Muir, was published in 1937. In 1999, the book was listed in Maman 100 Books of the Century and as number two of the best German novels of the 20th century. On his 30th birthday, the chief cashier of a bank, Joseph K., is unexpectedly arrested by two unidentified agents from an unspecified agency for an unspecified crime. The agent's boss later arrives and holds a mini-tribunal in the room of Kay's neighbor, Fräulein Bursner. Kay, is not taken away, however, but left free and told to await instructions from the Committee of Affairs. He goes to work, and that night apologizes to Fräulein Bursner for the intrusion into her room. At the end of the conversation he suddenly kisses her. Kay receives a phone call summoning him to court, and the coming Sunday is arranged as the date. No time is set. But the address is given to him. The address turns out to be a huge tenement building. Kay has to explore to find the court, which turns out to be in the attic. The room is airless, shabby, and crowded, and although he has no idea what he is charged with, or what authorizes the process, Kay makes a long speech denigrating the whole process, including the agents who arrested him. During this speech, an attendant's wife and a man engage in sexual activities. Kay then returns home. Kay later goes to visit the court again although he has not been summoned, and finds that it is not in session. He instead talks with the attendant's wife, who attempts to seduce him into taking her away, and who gives him more information about the process and offers to help him. K. Later goes with the attendant to a higher level of the attic where the shabby and airless offices of the court are housed. K. returns home to find Fräulein Montauk, a lodger from another room, moving in with Fräulein Burstner. He suspects that this is to prevent him from pursuing his affair with the latter woman. Yet another lodger, Captain Lands, appears to be in league with Montauk. Later, in a storeroom at his own bank, Kay discovers the two agents who arrested him being whipped by a flogger for asking Kay dot for bribes and as a result of complaints Kay made at port. Kay tries to argue with the flogger, saying that the men need not be whipped, but the flogger cannot persuade. The next day he returns to the storeroom and is shocked to find everything as he had found it the day before, including the whipper and the two agents. K. is visited by his uncle, who is K.'s guardian. The uncle seems distressed by K.'s predicament. At first sympathetic, he becomes concerned that K. Dot is underestimating the seriousness of the case. The uncle introduces K. to a lawyer, who is attended by Lenny, a nurse, whom K.'s uncle suspects is the advocate's mistress. During the discussion it becomes clear how different this process is from regular legal proceedings, guilt is assumed, the bureaucracy running it is vast with many levels, and everything is secret, from the charge, to the roles of the court, to the authority behind the courts even the identity of the judges at the higher levels. The attorney tells him that he can prepare a brief for K, but since the charge is unknown and the rules are re-unknown, it is difficult work. It also never may be read, but is still very important. The lawyer says that his most important task is to deal with powerful court officials behind the scenes. As they talk, the lawyer reveals that the chief clerk of the court has been sitting hidden in the darkness of a corner. The chief clerk emerges to join the conversation, but Kay is called away by Lenny, who takes him to the next room, where she offers to help him and seduces him. They have a sexual encounter. Afterwards, Kay meets his uncle outside, who is angry, claiming that Kay's lack of respect has hurt Kay's case. K visits the lawyer several times. The lawyer tells him incessantly how dear his situation is and tells many stories of other hopeless clients and of his behind the scenes efforts on behalf of these clients, and brags about his many connections. The brief is never completed. K's work at the bank deteriorates as he is consumed with worry about his case. K is surprised by one of his bank clients, who tells K that he is aware that K 
is dealing with a trial. The client learned of Kay's case from Ty Dorelli, a painter, who has dealings with the court and told the client about Kay's case. The client advises Kay Doc to go to Ty Dorelli for advice. Ty Dorelli lives in the attic of a tenement in a suburb on the opposite side of town from the court that Kay Dot visited. Three teenage girls taunt Kay. On the steps and tease him sexually. Ty Dorelli turns out to be an official painter of portraits for the court, an inherited position, and has a deep understanding of the process. Kay learns that, to Ty Dorelli's knowledge, not a single defendant has ever been acquitted. He sets out Kay's options and offers to help Kay with either of two options, which are obtain a provisional verdict of innocence from the lower court, which can be overturned at any time by higher levels of the court, which would lead to reinitiation of the process, or curry favor with the lower judges to keep the process moving at a glacial pace. Ty Dorelli has Kay leave through a small back door, as the girls are blocking the door through which Kay Dot entered. To Kay's shock, the door opens into another warren of the court's offices, again shabby and airless. Kay decides to take control of matters himself and visits his lawyer with the intention of dismissing him. At the lawyer's office he meets a downtrodden individual, Block, a client who offers Kay some insight from a client's perspective. Block's case has continued for five years and he has gone from being a successful businessman to being almost bankrupt and is virtually enslaved by his dependence on the lawyer and Lenny, with whom he appears to be sexually involved. The lawyer mocks Block in front of Kay for his dog-like subservience. This experience further poisons Kay's opinion of his lawyer. This chapter was left unfinished by the author. Kay is asked by the bank to show an Italian client around local places of cultural interest, but the Italian client, short of time, asks Kay Dot to take him only to the cathedral, setting a time to meet there. When the client does not show up, Kay explores the cathedral, which is empty except for an old woman and a church official. Kay notices a priest who seems to be preparing to give a sermon from a small second pulpit, and Kay Dot begins to leave, lest it begin in Kay. Be compelled to stay for its entirety. Instead of giving a sermon, the priest calls out Kay's name. Kay approaches the pulpit and the priest berates him for his attitude toward the trial and for seeking help, especially from women. Kay asks him to come down and the two men walk inside the cathedral. The priest works for the court as a chaplain and tells Kay a fable which was published earlier as before the law, that is meant to explain his situation. Kay and the priest discuss the parable. The priest tells Kay that the parable is an ancient text of the court, and many generations of court officials have interpreted it differently. On the eve of Kay's 31st birthday, two men arrive at his apartment. He has been waiting for them, and he offers little resistance, indeed the two men take direction from Kay. As they walk through town, Kay leads them to a quarry where the two men place Kay's head on a discarded block. One of the men produces a double edged butcher knife, and as the two men pass it back and forth between them, the narrator tells us that Kay Dot knew then precisely that it would have been his duty to take the knife and thrust it into himself. He does not take the knife. One of the men holds his shoulder and pulls him up, and the other man stabs him in the heart and twists the knife twice. Kay Dot's last words are, like a dog. The trial can be interpreted from various different angles, and literary critics have not agreed on one clear-cut interpretation. Generally, there are five major perspectives. Concerning these categories, however, there is one important point that should not be overlooked. Although the diverse studies theorizing about the novel provide valuable insights, they are often impeded by the critics' eagerness to squeeze these insights into a frame which, ultimately, is beyond the novel's text. This, by the way, is not a phenomenon unique to the trial. Kafka's novel The Castle shows similar tendencies as well. Only later interpretations, for example by the German writer Martin Walzer, express an increasing demand for a strictly text-based view. Current works, for example by the contemporary literary critic Peter Andre Alt, go into the same direction. The myth of guilt and judgment discussed in the trial has its cultural roots in the Hasidic tradition, where tales of plaintiff and defendant, heavenly judgment and punishment, unfathomable authorities and obscure charges are not uncommon. First of all, there are many parallels between Kafka's The Trial and his other major novel, The Castle. In both novels, the protagonist wanders through a labyrinth that seems to be designed to make him fail or even seems to have no relation to him at all. Ill, bedridden men explain the system in lengthy terms. Erotically charged female figures turn to the protagonist in a demanding way. Written around the same time, in October 1914, the short story in the penal colony bears close resemblance to the trial. 
In both cases, the delinquent does not know what he is charged with. A single person, an officer with a gruesome machine, seems to be accuser, judge and executioner in one. The idea that a single executioner could be enough to arbitrarily replace the entire court is exactly what Joseph K. is frightened about. Three years later, Kafka wrote the parable The Knock at the Manor Gate, which almost appears to be an abridged version of the trial. An action is brought out of nowhere or without any reason and it ends in a disastrous entanglement and inevitable punishment. Fate strikes the narrator by chance in the middle of everyday life. Kafka scholar Ralph Sudow states that, a sense of punishment or perhaps an unconscious demand for punishment, and a tragic or absurd downfall are signaled in this context. Ein Vorgefühl von Strafe oder vielleicht kein Unbewusst Strafe für Langen, und ein Tragischer oder Absurder Untergang wird und dabei signalize a er. For Joseph K., the court is an anonymous and unfamiliar power. Unlike the courthouse in the Palace of Justice, this court is characterized by widely branched, impenetrable hierarchies. There seems to be an infinite number of instances and K only gets in contact with the lowest ones. In spite of his efforts, K is unable to discover the court's nature. The clergyman's words in the cathedral, the court doesn't want anything from you. It takes you in when you come and sets you free when you leave, don't provide any help. Could K simply evade the court? His reality looks different. For K, the court remains mysterious and not really explicable. Joseph K has to confront a cold world that puts him off. While the main character in Kafka's parable before the law is asking fleas for help, Joseph K. turns to women, a painter and advocates to help him. However, they only feign their influence and keep him waiting. In this way, the people K. is asking for help act like the doorkeeper in said parable. They all accept presents from the main character, but only to put him off and to not disillusion him in believing that acting in this way will help his cause. Like in Kafka's novel The Castle. The range of manifold interpretations may only be covered selectively and not conclusively. One possible interpretative approach is to read the novel autobiographically. This claim is supported by the similarities in the initials of Fräulein Burstner and Felice Bauer. Elias Canetti points out that the intensely detailed description of the court system hints at Kafka's work as an insurance lawyer. Theodore W. Adorno takes the opposite view. According to him, the trial does not tell the story of an individual fate but rather contains wide-reaching political and visionary aspects and can be read as a vision predicting the Nazi terror. German scholar Klaus Ebel offers a synthesis of these two positions and demonstrates that the negotiating strategy used by the bureaucratic court system during the process to demoralize Kafka is reminiscent of the deficiencies in the Austro-Hungarian Empire's judicial system. Over the course of the novel, it becomes evident that K and the court do not face each other as distinct separate entities but that they are interweaved. This interweaving between K and the court system increasingly intensifies throughout the novel. Towards the end of the trial, K. realizes that everything that is happening stems from his inner self and is the result of feelings of guilt and fantasies of punishment. Worth mentioning is also the dreamlike component of the events, like in a dream. K's interior and exterior world intermingle. A transition from the fantastic realistic to the allegorical psychological level can be made out. Even K's working environment is increasingly undermined by a fantastic, dreamlike world. It is, for example, a work order that leads to K's encounter with the priest. Sexual references The protagonist's feelings of guilt are likely to be rooted in the views on sexuality that prevailed at the beginning of the 20th century and are mirrored in the works of Sigmund Freud. According to Peter Andre Alt, sexuality and case trial are connected in remarkable ways. Women are portrayed as sirens, the representatives of the court as lecherous. K himself cannot control his lust for Fräulein Burstner. Furthermore, critics identified homoerotic elements in the text, for instance K's ironic and almost loving view of his director. Elegant or tight-fitting clothes on men are mentioned several times throughout the novel. The half-naked flogger punishing the officers Willem and Franz, who are naked as well, resembles sadomasochism. According to Kafka's friends, he laughed out loud several times while reading from his book. It is thus reasonable to look for humorous aspects in the trial despite its dark and serious essence. This phenomenon is also addressed by Kafka biographer Reiner Stach, the trial is gruesome in its entirety, but comical in its details. The judges read porn magazines instead of law books and send for women as if they were ordering a splendid meal on a tray. The executioners look like aging tenors. 
Due to a hole in the floor of one of the courtrooms, an advocate's leg protrudes into the room below from time to time. Notes Bibliography Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.